Welcome to Christian Living 101 Bible Studies. Our mission is to prepare every believer for the trials of daily life. Are you ready for eternity? Can you face Jesus, the King of Kings, upon His return? Do you know the pathway to everlasting life? Listen to God's Word presented without church or organizational bias as you study with Pastor Applegate. Now we join Christian Living 101 in progress. They tell me of the home far beyond the sky. They tell me of the home far away. Oh, they tell me of the home where no storm clouds lie. Oh, they tell me of the home's white day. Oh, the land of cloudless day. Oh, the land of the clouded sky. They tell me of a home where no storm clouds by. Oh, they tell me of an unclouded day. They tell me of a home where the saints have gone. Oh, they tell me of a land far away. Where the tree of life and culture even bloom. Yes, it's fragrant to the unclouded day. Have you noticed today how much pressure there is on everyone? Nearly everyone I talk to talks about the fact that uh, they're tired, they're weary, it's just as hard for them to get one foot in front of the other. And uh, it seems like that uh, no matter what I do, I try to get some rest and I find myself in a situation where uh, it's interrupted and there's more pressure brought on and it just seems like that there's one crisis after another, uh, one kind of pressure after another, and I just can't seem to get anywhere when it comes to enjoying life a little bit and finding rest in my body and in my mind, of course, and uh, I don't know what to do about it. Well, we need to recognize that we're in the last days of time that was prophesied way back in the Old Testament uh, when Daniel was telling us about uh, the vision that God had given unto him and the revelation of what was going to take place in the last days. Daniel 7.25 uh, pretty well describes where we are today. And it says that the devil is going to wear out the saints and, and try to destroy them through pressure and weariness as certain we find on every hand today. Uh, life is becoming faster and more furious and more dangerous and certainly the end times that both Daniel and Jesus and John the Revelator talked about is upon us. And uh, we need, I think, to look at this and realize that there is an answer 
and that our Lord, remember we talked about this last week, the fact that uh, our Lord is our Passover, uh, that he's able to keep us and preserve us and, and lift us from a, a position of danger into a position of safety and peace and rest. And so let's go to Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. And these words I think we need to learn to live by uh, more effectively. You think about yourself, if it applies to you, great. If it doesn't, why uh, put it in the back of your mind. It'll come in handy one of these days for you. And perhaps it will be there that you might encourage someone else in their service for the Lord. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You say, well, Pastor, uh, what does it mean? Come unto me, all ye that labor. Well, first of all, it means come unto the Lord. Come unto me, the Lord. And what he's saying is, uh, you can come unto me. You know, one of the big problems that we have today as um, individuals, and I suppose it's part of our nature down through the years, we find that um, it's easier to try anything and everything else before we really try the Lord. I don't know if you found that to be a problem in your life, but it's amazing how often we want to try to take care of the situations, deal with the problems, find solutions for the complications of life before we take it to the Lord and say, Lord, here I am. I'm just uh, your servant down here in a wicked world, and I need some help. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, when you need help, come unto me. When you're laboring and you're tired and you're weary, come unto me. And you know, I found that when we can do that, the first thing that happens is that we focus in upon our Lord. We begin to realize how precious and wonderful He is. We begin to realize how many times He's been there for us in times past. And, and pretty soon we find ourselves focusing upon our Lord and what He is doing and what He has done and what we are asking Him to do or want to ask Him to do uh, at the moment. And, and the things that we come to Him about become dimmer and smaller and less important and less pressurized upon our mind and our spirit uh, than they were before we came unto Him. And while we struggle and we try and we strive and we uh, experiment with every kind of a solution and all different kinds of things uh, uh, to try to handle our daily difficulties and the weariness of life, I don't know, we just do. But we need to learn not to. And so what I'm saying to you today, beloved, we need to learn to come to Him. Come unto me, Jesus said. Who, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Well, if you're struggling with difficulties in life, problems before you, situations you can't find a solution to, uh, difficulties that uh, only uh, a miracle can provide anyway, uh, why do we struggle with it and try to take care of it ourselves? Let's just take it to Jesus. Let's just say, Lord, here am I, and I'm claiming your word that you give unto me in Matthew, the 11th chapter, and the 28th verse. Come unto me, all ye that labor, and what? I will give you rest. There's something about the presence of our Lord and the ministry of the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, the receiving and, and eating upon the Word of God, which is the bread of life, that makes the problems of life grow dimmer and makes the prospects and the hope and the faith of, of our spirit uh, increase. And we begin to find that we're in a situation uh, where uh, we can lay it upon the Lord because He's been here before us. He's already uh, been through what uh, uh, we're going through, and He understands, and, and by His Spirit, His Word, and uh, His loving care for His people, He's going to comfort us and strengthen us and enlighten us and bring us to a point 
where we can walk in faith without being troubled uh, about things that we haven't found a solution for yet. But also, we will often find that as we come to that place of rest in the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and put our trust in Him, we find that it isn't very long until all at once there's a solution. Or all at once the problem takes care of itself in one way or another. So we think. And uh, we begin to realize, you know what? I was being pressured and worrying about this and being stressed about this. And all I needed to do was come to Jesus. You say, but pastor, he's not interested in the minor, many things of life that we go through that we think are so big and so huge. Oh, is that right? Well, now, wait a minute. If I recall correctly, the Word of God tells me that He went to the cross and that He took our, our iniquity upon Him, that He went through everything that we go through, and that He came through victorious and paid the price to get the problem solved, whatever it might be. And so, maybe, just maybe, we ought to think about this scripture first. All ye that are weary and heavy laden, come unto me. And let's learn to go unto him first. It's not a bad thing to say, Lord, I'm confused, or I'm stumped, or I don't have the wisdom or the knowledge to handle this situation, or I don't understand why this has come upon me and what I'm to do with it. Uh, what are you trying to teach me, Father? Are you trying to lead me in a different path than I'm going? On and on and on. Many questions we could ask the Lord. But when we begin to focus in on Him, and we begin to put our dependence upon Him, and allow Him to keep the promise that He made to us way back when He was here on this earth, uh, and uh, was uh, living uh, uh, the life of the only begotten Son of God, here in this world, before he went to the cross and took all of our sin and iniquity upon him, uh, we need to remember that he does care. He does know. He has lived it. And so, instead of uh, going to friends or uh, some uh, counselor or uh, whatever it might be that we turn to, uh, who probably has never walked where we are anyway, and we ask them advice and direction, and they're as bewildered as we are, but they'll do their best, and, and they'll give us this idea and that idea, and well, you ought to do this, and, and you ought to do that. Now, bear with me with this. You need to remember, they've never been where you are, but you're depending upon them to guide you, and to strengthen you, and to give you insight and wisdom that you cannot find. I think we would be smart if we would learn the lesson of those three little words, Come unto me. We need to learn to run to the Lord. You know, when we were children, at least I suppose that all of us were children, uh, there was a time uh, when if we would get hurt or we would have a problem or we would be afraid of something, be uh, uh, scared out of our wits as it were, uh, whatever the situation might be, uh, what did we do? Did uh, did we uh, run someplace and, and try to find somebody to talk to? Yeah, we did, but it was that someone was mom or dad, wasn't it? Come running to them. Come running to them. Why? Because we knew we would be received by them. And you need to learn, we need to learn, that we will be received when we say, Jesus, I need some help. I'm come to you. I don't know even how to express what I need. But then comes the reality and the thought, sometimes I don't have to explain it. Most of the time I don't have to explain it because Jesus already knows what I'm going through and what's going on in my life anyway, doesn't he? And so why don't we learn to run to him more often? I think we should. And then he goes on in verse 29, and, and he gives some instruction that I think a lot of us uh, don't really quite comprehend. He says, Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, 
for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Hmm. Now the soul is different than the spirit. The soul is that part of us. I'm not sure how to describe it. Is our is it our our personality? Is that our uh, uh, lifestyle? Is that our intellect? Is that uh, uh, something else? Uh, uh, but it's the real us that live in this body. And that real us is a soul, which, by the way, does have a spirit. And so, what he's saying unto you, don't be afraid of me. I'm not going to put more upon you than you can bear. And when you come to me for help, I'm not going to knock you down and slap you and tell you how ignorant and stupid you are, how you should already know the answer to that. I'm not going to belittle your intellect or your knowledge or your understanding. I'm not going to reprimand you. I'm not going to punish you. I'm not going to judge you. I'm here to help you. Yes, that's our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the man. The man who gave his life, that you and I might have life and have it eternally. And forevermore. Now, we shall see. And so he says, don't be afraid to take my yoke upon you. What's his yoke? His yoke is that, that connection that we have with him. Don't be afraid to be tied to me. Don't be afraid to grab me by the hem of my garment. Don't be afraid to come crying to me in, in a panic. Don't feel like I'm going to knock you down, condemn you, reprimand you. I'm going to open my arms to you because I'm not going to judge you when you come for help. And sometimes, you know, I think we've all found that uh, that's a better deal than even what our parents can give us sometimes. Now, most of the time, I know and understand that parents are sympathetic and helpful and do everything they can to help. But sometimes in the frustration of our slowness to learn and inability to remember, uh, they can have a way of... Uh, sort of slapping it back into our face. And of course, none of us like that, but uh, maybe that's what has to happen to get our attention. I don't know. But I do know this. Jesus said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to rebuff you. I'm going, if you take my yoke, if you line up with me, uh, what's a yoke? Well, I'm reminded of a yoke being that uh, uh, piece of... Uh, wood or leather or whatever, metal uh, it might be, uh, that uh, people put upon uh, the oxen that pull the plow in the field in the old days. And uh, I think in those days it was basically wood. And the yoke was that which went around their neck, and there was a continuing connection to another yoke, and that was the teammate uh, that... Uh, it was put around their neck, and they would pull together. They were yoked together. You and I need to quit being afraid of being yoked together with our Lord, because uh, our Lord is all-powerful. He has all ability, all knowledge, all wisdom, all understanding, great compassion and love. Why wouldn't we want to be yoked to Him? And so we need to learn to take His yoke upon us. It's not hard to bear. Because he pulls the load. I remember uh, when uh, I was a young man, before the day of tractors in the part of the country we lived in, uh, my dad had a team of horses, and uh, he would hook them up to a, an old plow that he had to hang on to the handles with all of his might, and sometimes put all of his weight on them to keep them in the ground, and the team would pull along and would plow the field. I remember every once in a while that he would have to uh, uh, take the uh, uh, whip or the end of the reins that he had and give uh, one horse a, a whack across the rear because that horse was pulling back and was letting the other horse do all the work. When we yoke up with the Lord, he doesn't expect us to do all the work. 
He says, my yoke is easy. I'll carry the load. I'll pull it along. And uh, uh, you won't have to take a, a swat on your rump in order to get you into action to pull your part. I'll be there. And my yoke is easy. And you can learn of me, for I'm meek. That means he's... Uh, He's not aggressive. He's not forceful and overbearing. Uh, he has unusual and absolute authority and power, but it's always under such control that he does not have to demonstrate it and will not demonstrate it against us when we come unto him for help. Now, he may use it when we need some discipline and refuse to come to him, and he may use it against our enemies when they try to overwhelm us. But I want you to know uh, that uh, uh, he will not put the burden that we have said unto him I can't handle back upon us and say, well, it's not my problem. You better take care of that yourself. What are you, a dummy? No. His yoke is easy. He's meek. He's not going to be condemning. He's not going to harass. He's not going to rebuke. He's going to say, learn of me, I'll teach you. And he is lowly in heart. That means that he takes the same level of life and understanding toward us in which we are. And sometimes we're sort of pitiful, aren't we? And I believe that in those times that our Lord is very, very lowly. He comes right down and, and he comes around us and takes his great arm and lifts us up and supports us. Uh, he comforts us with his words, with his spirit, with his love. And uh, uh, he's not put himself above us. He doesn't make himself to be uh, the almighty, holy, know-it-all, though he really is and has a right to be there. But no. He knows how to lower himself to a level wherein we can understand that he understands where we are and what we need. He's going to pull with us, but he's going to pull ahead of us because we're just going to have the easy row of that yoke that is linked unto him, letting him do the pulling. And I want you to know we need to learn to do that in this day and age because times are getting worse. They're going to become more and more dangerous and we're living closer and closer to the end time. And I'm not saying that just lightheartedly. I believe that time is speeding up. The events of the last days are speeding up. And I think we're going to see things begin to happen quicker and faster and more harsh and uh, much more difficult to deal with than what we can even imagine today. And even though I'm up many years of age, I'm well aware that I could live long enough to see all of this come to pass. And so uh, I worry about, well, I won't say I worry, I'm concerned about those of us uh, who are much younger, who have not learned how to put their trust in the Lord, who have not learned how to put their yoke uh, uh, onto Him uh, and take His yoke upon them, where they've not learned how to be dependent and trustworthy in the power and the ability of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring us through whatever storm we might be facing or heartache we might be enduring or infirmity that we might be going through. He knows how to help and strengthen and encourage, and He knows how to build our faith and keep us from falling into despair and making bad decisions or wrong decisions and giving up. And so, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. Why? For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. My yoke is easy to wear. It's easy to be tied to me. It's easy to be yoked together with me. And in that, I'm not going to overburden you. I'm going to make your load light, because I'm going to carry the weight of your burden. 
And so I think it's something that we can dwell upon, something that we can rejoice in, and something that we can be encouraged in, and we need to learn to do it quickly when troubles come our way and uncertainties uh, fill our pathway. And so, beloved, I just want to encourage you, come unto the Lord and take His yoke upon you and you'll find rest and peace for your soul. And that's the real you that lives inside this old body of flesh. Now I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. It says this, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that, this is verse 10 and 11 now, for he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. And what the Lord is saying here, there is a time that he is going to bring us to a place of peace and rest. Now yes, this could very well be talking about the time when we pass from this old carnal, sinful, uh, evil world in which we live, uh, into uh, the gates of eternity uh, through death. There's no doubt that that can apply to that. But I believe with all of my heart that the Lord has shown me that there are going to be places in our life where we've gone through the hard, difficult, uh, uh, anguishing times that seem to be so overwhelming, and we're going to get through them with the Lord's help, and there's going to be a time of rest uh, where he's going to allow us to continue to function, take care of the cares of life in this world and, and the responsibilities that we have toward our family and, and other situations and people, and that there will be a, a, a pause, there will be a time of rest and peace, a, a time of, of regeneration and renewal of spirit, a time of refreshing and revival within our heart and our spirit and our soul, and, and, and a time of really genuine, pure enjoyment that he will afford unto us before he allows another set of problems to come our way. Now we know that as long as we live here on this earth, there's going to be problems. There's going to be battles to fight. There's going to be enemies that want to destroy us. And there's going to be uh, times when we have to wage war with all of our might. And we grow weary. There's no doubt about that. But then again, what do we do? Come unto the Lord. All ye that are weary and heavy laden. Now, go with me. Into verse uh, 11 says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. Lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. See, I, you know, I pastored churches for a long time, and now I've been a Bible teacher for a long time, going on, uh, well, I have for all these years, for that matter, but uh, I retired from the pastorate in 1996, and so, what is it now, 19 years uh, that uh, I've been teaching and preaching the Word of God in a different format. And I just want you to know that I've seen so many people come to the point where they're just about to break through into the victory, into the time of rest that the Lord has prepared for them. And uh, the old enemy comes and, and he tries to do something that uh, will uh, distract us and, and uh, undermine our faith. And they give up, throw up their hands, and they just wither and give up, even give up serving the Lord faithfully. You say, Pastor, that shouldn't be. Well, no, of course it shouldn't be. But it happens when we fail to make Jesus our Lord and our leader as well as our friend and our comforter and our helper. He's all of those things. And uh, only He can be all of those things. And sometimes I think we go looking for someone that uh, we think is uh, pretty nice or pretty great or pretty smart, maybe even pretty famous and popular, and we sort of think, well, they've got the answers because of where they are in their life. If only we knew where they are in their life, perhaps. But 
that beside the point. We need to remember that nobody in this world can understand our place and situation and problem like Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Redeemer. And so we go on. It says, Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest. I think I just read that. Let's look at the verse 12. For the word of God. Now hear me, this is what God has given unto us. Now the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder, or apart that means, of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We have thoughts, ideas, hidden agendas, uh, that we like to uh, think we're hiding from God. And if we don't bring it into a vocal or an action part of our life, then God doesn't know anything about it. Well, now let me see what this said again. The Word of God's quick and it's powerful and it's sharp. Sharper than any two-edged sword. Well, I've seen some pretty sharp two-edged swords and I don't want them coming my way. And uh, it says, uh, even dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit. Remember I told you a few minutes ago that the soul and the spirit are two separate things. I don't know how you can separate them, but the word of God can, and it does in many instances. And uh, it says it can even separate the joints and the marrow. Well now, this modern age of knowledge and medical science and all of that, uh, study of the anatomy and, and so forth, uh, we discover that uh, uh, the joint and the bone, or the marrow and the bone, is uh, pretty tightly knit together. And you're not going to get along very well without both. One or the other uh, comes into difficulty, we're in trouble. And uh, God says that His Word can even sort that out uh, and uh, decipher and discern that. Then it says that He even is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Now let me tell you this. The Word of God says, Think on those things which are upright, pure. It tells us that the carnal mind is enmity with God. Well, the carnal mind is where we do our thinking. I think. Sometimes I think we think without using our carnal mind, if you know what I mean. But just the same, my point is this. God knows what's in your head. He knows where you're really at. You know, you put on a great scene in front of other Christians and you've got the language down and you know the actions that's expected of a believer and you know uh, the kind of a life that you're supposed to put forth outwardly to uh, be a good witness as a believer and you may do all of that but down inside you may have all kinds of ugly thoughts, sinful hungers and desires. You may be overwhelmed with different kinds of lusts, and uh, I'm talking about there's many kinds of lust, and uh, uh, you may have all that going on within. Well, you need to know, beloved, God sees that. The Lord knows what you're thinking. The Lord knows what your desire is. You may say, well, now I'm going to do this because God tells me I've got to do it, but this is not what I want to do. I'm going to hurry and get this done, and then I'm going to do what I want to do. Oh, well, of course, now the Lord didn't know any of that, did he? Of course he did. And see, we're a little bit on the slow side when we stop and consider how transparent we are before Almighty God. Think about that. Now, I want to take you on, and uh, let's go to verse number 13. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Now manifest means totally exposed, totally revealed, totally recorded. 
There's not anything left out. When he looks upon us, he sees the whole of us. Everything about us. And, oh no, Lord, you can't see this. You can't see... Oh, but yes, he can. And see, oftentimes the old enemy comes along and just as he is always the liar, he continues to lie. And he says, you know what? God didn't really mean that, or God meant that in a different way, or you know God is love, and uh, you can go ahead and do what you want to do and be, and even though you know it's not right, God's a big God, and He's full of love and grace and mercy, and it doesn't matter. He'll overlook it. Oh, He will? That's not what the Word of God says. He'll not overlook it, and it's exposed before him like an open book with nothing left out. Now, but all things are naked. Now, this is in that 13th verse. All things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Can you imagine that? Now, this was a message given to the Hebrews. That's why it's called Hebrews. To the Hebrews, instruction that Paul says God revealed unto him he was supposed to leave with them. The Israelites, if you please. Well, you say it's a message to us today. Well, if you're not an Israelite or a Hebrew and you're a Christian, of course that's true. If you're not a Christian, whether you are an Israelite and a Hebrew or whether you're not, uh, you're just outside uh, of the safety realm of God and the, the new life in the Lord Jesus Christ and eternal life forever uh, in a perfect situation and setting for all eternity. It was extended to the house of Israel. And by the way, if you're a Gentile that has been grafted into the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ your Lord, you need to know that as far as God is concerned, you've become an Israelite. And you need to know that. You might not like to know that, but you need to know that. You're an Israelite. You're a Hebrew. God has only one kingdom. There is none other he does not have two kingdoms that he's going to have. Well, here's going to be those that are less uh, less righteous over here in this kingdom of mine, and I'll I'll overlook uh, uh, their imperfections, and and uh, no, they don't really believe in Jesus as Lord and Redeemer, but they're good people, and and so I've got a place for them, and no, I'm not going to send them out into the outer darkness of judgment at the end time. That's a lie. That's Satan's lie. We are all one people. The Bible makes it very plain, and I've taught on it a number of times, that if you've been born into the kingdom of God and are genuinely converted, you have become a new creation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Now, if he's a high priest, he has to be a man. I make that point just for those of you who insist that no, he wasn't a man, he was God. He was a man who had the Word of God implanted within him from the time of his conception. Now, let's go on. Let us hold fast our profession. You see, beloved, and we're going to see this more and more as the pressure of the times come upon us more quickly. There is going to be pressure to deny your profession. What's your profession? Your profession is, I'm a child of the King. I've been born again. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I have the Word of God, the righteousness of my Lord within. And it's mine if I will choose to walk in it. And all of those things. 
And so then we find that the 14th verse says, as we've already read, we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our profession. Now, you can fail in a lot of ways. Your faith can waver in some areas. You can get discouraged in some areas. But if you come to the place where you disassociate yourself with Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Redeemer, you are in trouble because you have just let go of your profession. You have severed yourself from Jesus Christ. And so I want to tell you, beloved, it is important that we cling fervently to the knowledge, the belief, the confidence, the faith, the determination, the surety, I don't know how I'd find enough words to describe it, of the faithfulness of, and the victory that our Lord Jesus Christ has brought to all of us who have been born again into his kingdom through the shedding of his blood. Think about that. Let it soak in. Chew on it a while. And you'll be amazed at how important that statement is. Let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews uh, uh, verse 15 now in chapter 4. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Our infirmities, our weaknesses, frailties, failures, shortcomings, inabilities, whatever word you want to put on it, but was in all points tempted like as we are. He was severely tried like as we are, yet without sin. He was able to go through it all and never sin. Now, you and I can't do that. We haven't done that. We could do that if we were strong enough in our faith and walked to, uh, as yoked together with the Lord all the time as we ought. We could do that. But we don't do that, do we? And so, what do we do then? Well, now here is the answer. It says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Yes, you and I are weak sometimes. Yes, our faith is going to grow weak sometimes. Yes, we're going to become weary in well-doing sometimes. Yes, we may deliberately or innocently or in some kind of a trap be brought into a point of sin and disobedience sometimes. It happens. But what we need to understand is that we have a high priest that we can come to who has already been proven with all of that stuff and he did not fail. And so he then can add unto us the strength, the wisdom, the spirit, the confidence, the understanding, the helps that we need, whatever we're looking for. And we need to learn to come to him boldly that he might give unto us mercy and that we might find grace from him to help us in our time of failure, shortcoming, whatever it is. And so we need to learn to do that. Well, again, Pastor, I've got this problem and that problem and I'm going through this and I'm going through that and all kinds of things. It's too many of them for me even to try to, to talk about. But every one of us have those times wherein things just aren't easy to deal with. And what happens? Instead of coming boldly into the throne of God, we tiptoe around. Well, I really don't know, Lord, if you understand. And I, I really don't know what you think about this. Uh, 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 maybe, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll deal with it for a while. And I'll, I'll come back and talk to you later. And you approach the throne of God again. Want to come in. 
and you get to the door and instead of knocking and going on in, you go, oh, I guess there's nobody home. And you turn around and leave. Now, Pastor, that's stupid. Oh, is it? Well, just look at your life and see what you've done. I think most of us will find there's been those times that we sort of tiptoed towards the throne of God. God wants us to come rushing in boldly. It's our place. It's, it's our home. He's our Father. He is there for us. We are there to serve Him. We are to have nothing hidden from Him. So we come boldly into the throne of God. Why? that we might obtain mercy. I remember when uh, one of our girls was little. She was standing in the front yard talking with the... Uh, her, her sister was standing in the front yard uh, talking with a, a boy that uh, they were sort of interested in each other perhaps. I don't know. But the boy had a dog. And the dog was there. It had always been peaceable. No problem. Nothing. Nothing at all uh, to indicate that there would ever be a problem with the dog. But as they're standing there talking and the little sister is standing by her big sister's hand, all at once the dog reaches out and bites her. And so when that happened, uh, she just, oh, 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 oh the, do the dog bit me, the dog bit me. Uh, uh, the, the dog bit me. Oh, no. No, that's not what happened. What happened? Ouch! The dog bit me! Got the attention real quick of everybody around about. We need to learn to come to God in that kind of boldness. But God's God, he'll strike me down. Oh, it just said he wouldn't up here in the previous verse. Do you believe that? Come boldly unto the throne of grace. We need to come running. And you know what happens when we come running? The great arms of our Lord reaches out and they're open. As we come running... He holds us close, comforts us, strengthens us, heals and delivers, protects, provides, all of those things because we know whom we have believed and we know whom we should go to in the time of need. And it be will, I'm bewildered. I am puzzled at the numbers of people who will try everything else in the world to take care of needs and problems that they cannot, and they know they cannot handle themselves, but they'll try to find an answer everywhere else, but they don't go to God. We're living in an age, listen to me, we're living in an age where we better learn to come to God boldly. Because the enemy is stretching forth his evil works with more intensity and determination to destroy every Christian on the face of the earth than ever before. Because he knows his time is short. You and I need to recognize that we're in a battle that's greater than what we can handle. And so we need to yoke with our Lord. We need to turn unto Him in the hour of need. We need to come boldly into His throne. We need to hold fast to the profession of our faith. And we need to stand victoriously in the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ as we serve Him day by day. And with that, I hope this has been a time of encouragement for you a time of instruction that you might learn from and make it an opportunity to draw closer to the Lord 
and to really walk into a relationship with God that's greater than any you've ever had as you face the trials of life that are confronting you today. And with that, I have to say to you, it's time for us to prepare for communion, and we'll be right back in just a, a moment or two and bring the communion service to you. God bless you, and thank you for being with us today. Praise His wonderful name. My heart is like a house One day I let my Savior in There were many rooms We used to visit now and then Then one day he found that door I knew the day had come too soon I said, Jesus, I'm not ready you to visit in that room That's a place in my heart Where even I don't go I had some things hidden there I didn't want no one to know But then he handed me the key With tears of love on his face Said I've come to set you free Let me go in your secret place And as he opened up that door And as the two of us walked in Lord, I was so ashamed As life revealed my hidden sin but when I think about that room now I'm not ashamed anymore Because I know my hidden sin No longer hides behind that door Is there a place in your heart Where even you won't go You've got that thing hidden there you don't want no one to know Now he's handing you that key See the tears of love on his face You know he came to set you free Let him go in your secret place Is there a place in your heart Where even you don't go You've got that thing hidden there That you don't want no one to know Now his hand in you that he See the tears of love on his face You know he came to set you free Let him go in your secret place You know he died to set you free let him go in your secret place. Now let us turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. And I'm going to begin reading with verse number 23. It says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat this, it's my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. I want you to take particular attention of that little phrase, my body which is broken for you. Verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup, what he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, listen to that, eateth and drinketh, damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, not giving proper reverence and appreciation 
for the Lord's body and what it went through for us. Let's go on. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. And so, beloved, let us take of this communion, bread, and cup, filled with the juice of the vine, representing the blood of Jesus. Let us take of it with great appreciation, thanksgiving, and love for what our Lord did for us. Let us pray. Father, again we come to you very aware that we're not perfect. That even though, Lord, we strive to live in your righteousness every moment of every day, sometimes we fall short. Sometimes we have a breakdown in one area of our life or another. And Lord, we ask you to forgive us and cleanse us for that. We ask you, Lord, to remove any stain or blemish that we've left upon your righteous garments. And Lord, I pray that as uh, we come to you and eat of this bread, that you'll make each and every one of us pure as can be. That you'll give us a deep understanding of what it means. A new appreciation and reverence for what you've done in our behalf. And so with that, Lord, we ask you to minister unto us according to the promise of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us eat together. Now remembering the price that Jesus paid for us at the cross, we take of it realizing and recognizing that it represents the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it is as we drink of it that we acknowledge, Lord, that you spilled your life's blood that we might have eternity with you without any sin or imperfection throughout the ages to come. And so we thank you for that, Lord. We ask your blessing upon this as we receive it. In Jesus' name, let us drink together. Praise the name of the Lord. God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Join in again this next week. Thank you for listening to Christian Living 101. Remember, we are totally dependent upon your prayers and generosity. Log on to ChristianLiving101.org. There are over 300 video Bible studies there, plus many other items of interest with Pastor Applegate. We welcome your prayer requests and your questions. Please contact us at Christian Living 101. That's P.O. Box 72150 in Phoenix, Arizona. 85050 or email gene at gene with a g-e-n-e gene at christianliving101.org at gene with a g-e-n-e gene at christianliving101.org